I thought we'd talk about a tweet by some guy called Brady Harron who put a picture up saying what's going on here. So I thought we would talk about it. That's me. That's you. So there's a rainbow there, but up there, there's like these double rainbows up above. The sun's over there. There's these double rainbows like that. And then the normal one, oh, it's sort of kind of fading out there. What you're actually seeing is in a very indirect way, the structure of a molecule. This is an electron microscope picture of a snowflake, which has six-fold symmetry, hexagonal symmetry to it. I don't really want to look at the snowflake, I want to look at these little hexagons all around. You see that little ice crystals that form in the atmosphere usually have this kind of hexagonal structure to them. In the 17th century, Johannes Kepler, the royal astronomer for Emperor Rudolf II, as was the way with astronomers in general throughout time, the person who was supposed to be paying him wasn't paying him. So he had no money. Um, and it was coming up to Christmas and he wanted a present for a friend of his and he was kind of walking across Prague in the snow, the snow was coming down and he saw these snowflakes on his jacket and became interested in the fact that they had this six-fold symmetry to them and so he wrote an essay about the six-fold symmetry of snow which he gave as a Christmas present to his friend and so it was a cheap gift basically but in that essay he talked about why it has this six-fold shape. He drew this sort of analogy with beehives you know they have the hexagonal structure inside beehives and he pointed out that this is the way that you can pack the most into a given space. The hexagons have this interesting property that they'll kind of tessellate together and you'll compact things as closely together. So he had this idea that it was something to do with the way Way that the smaller structures that went into the snowflake, what we would now think of as molecules, take up this hexagonal structure because that's the way to pack the maximum of them in. And indeed that's what's happening. Water molecules arrange themselves in such a way that they form little hexagons and then the little hexagons join together to form bigger hexagons and so on until you get all the way up to snowflakes. The smaller structures that happen much more often than snowflakes are these little hexagonal, sort of flattish hexagonal shapes. And they're what's responsible for your halo. In any cloud you've got these little hexagonal crystals forming and they tend to orientate themselves flat, just because that's the stable thing. If you think about leaves fluttering down from a tree, they, and it's the same in clouds. You have these crystals form, and as long as there's not too much turbulence in the cloud, they'll just sort of settle into these orientations. So you've got a cloud which is basically full of these little hexagonal crystals all aligned like that, and then you've got the sunlight shining on them. They're not completely transparent, so they act like little bits of glass or whatever. They've got a, a refractive index to them, which means that as light passes through them, it gets bent by them, and in fact, light of different colors gets bent by different amounts. The bright arc that you're seeing in the image that you took is actually where the light from the sun is coming in at sort of an oblique angle. It goes in through the top and then out through the side. But each time it goes through one of those surfaces, the path of the light gets bent a bit because it's passing from one medium air to another medium ice. Why does it make an arc? So the reason it makes an arc, if you look at these things, because they're, they're all aligned, if you think about it, the light's coming in, it's hitting all these different crystals at the same angle to the vertical and then it's passing through a surface which bends that vertical angle a bit and then through a horizontal surface which bends that angle a bit more. So the light came in and then got bent a bit, then got bent a bit more. So the light, instead of coming from over there, is now coming from higher in the sky, or appears to be coming from higher in the sky. The one thing that we haven't factored in is, although these things are all flat, their orientation in the other direction is random. And so that means sometimes it comes out sort of perpendicular to one of these faces and sometimes it comes out at an angle to them. That adds another refraction. So we, the, the amount the light is bent in the vertical direction is fixed, but the amount it's bent kind of azimuthally around just depends on what angle of surface it exits through. So the light is always kind of coming from the same direction vertically, but gets bent around depending on how it exits from that vertical face of the crystal. And so that's why you see the light coming from an arc. So that explains this thing, as I say, which is called a, a circumzenithal arc. So it's circumzenithal because zenith is the straight up direction and it's around the zenith. They all come from the same direction relative to the vertical, but different angles around. So you end up with an arc. Straight up is up here somewhere. And this, this is the circle around straight up. This thing is actually much rarer. That's called a supralateral arc. And that occurs because, so although all the crystals that water forms, at least at sort of atmospheric pressure, have this hexagonal symmetry, they don't always end up as these little flat things. That's the most common thing. But another possibility is they can actually grow into cylinders. Cylinders also tend to orientate themselves in a particular direction. They tend to orientate themselves with their long axis parallel to the Earth. You've got the light coming in through one of the long sides and then out through the flat end. But in this case, you can see that they're all kind of being bent 
around an axis which is parallel to the Earth rather than perpendicular to the Earth. The thing that you can change in this one is you can rotate that cylinder around, which means that the light always gets bent around a kind of a horizontal axis, but what angle around that horizontal axis it gets bent to depends on the orientation of this crystal. So this thing was around a vertical axis. This is actually a, an arc which is around a horizontal axis, and that's why it's a normal way up for a rainbow. So there's the, an axis pointing to you and you end up with this arc around that horizontal axis. These are much rarer. You'll see one of these about once a year rather than about you know, a dozen times a year. What you're actually seeing here is the crystal structure of ice, which is fundamentally driven by the, the molecules within it. And you're seeing different aspects of that molecular structure and how it forms different crystals, making these different colours arcs. Can you ever get the cylinder one without the hexagon one? I think it's unlikely because the, the flat things tend to form more commonly than the cylindrical things. So in order to get a decent number of cylindrical things, there's probably an awful lot of flat things around. This whole thing about crystal growth and why different crystals form in different circumstances is really not that well understood. And there are more complicated structures that ice can form. For example, it can form little pyramidal crystals sometimes as well, which produce a whole other set of rocks, but they're very, very rare. And the reasons why different arcs form in different circumstances, it's something to do with the, the properties within the cloud where it's forming, the exact state of the humidity and the temperature and all those kinds of things as to what kind of crystals form. Um, but it's really clearly quite subtle what it is that ends up forming. So I saw something reasonably special. You did. The, the bright one is fairly common, but not that often seen because people just don't look up often enough. But this one, the superlateral arc, really is a pretty rare phenomenon. All right, I feel like an explorer now. Yeah, you're a bit of a lightweight, though, because there are actually rather more spectacular arcs that get seen sometimes. Just before Christmas, this came out on the Astronomy Picture of the Day website of a set of arcs that somebody had seen. So your arcs are actually these two at the top. So there's your circumzenithal arc and there's your superlateral. Haran arcs, I prefer to call them. <laughs> I think they're reasonably, you know, well known at this point, so I don't think you get to call them after you. Oh, okay. But there's a whole bunch of different arcs due to different crystal structures, different orientations that can occur. This one, it's a little bit of a fudge because the reason why the arcs are so spectacular here is it turns out that just upwind from where this photograph was being taken, they were making snow for a ski resort which was throwing out lots and lots and lots of ice crystals, which clearly had just got carried off in the atmosphere to create this spectacular display. But there are actually arcs here which have never been seen before. So there's a whole new array of arcs which people are now trying to understand. So I got quite interested in this on the back of your photo and started nosing around. Turns out there's a really cool piece of software that's free to download and play with, a thing called Halo Sim that lets you figure out what the different arcs are. So you can actually set up different crystals in different orientations. You can move the sun around and see what kind of arcs you can make. And you can see that actually a lot of the things I just showed in that picture are, are here in that arc. So here are your arcs again. And here are a whole bunch of the arcs related to the ones that were in that other photo. Is it free software? Free software, free to download. Oh, I'll give that one a play. The temperature that the earth should be with the sun where it is and... Absolutely, that's the and in fact, interestingly, it is about the temperature of the moon. The average temperature of the moon is about minus 18, minus 20 centigrade, um, because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, and so that really is the end of the story as far as a body like the moon's concerned.